Good evening. Let's stand together tonight as we sing Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God when I was your foe still your love fought for me you have been so so good to me When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. Please. 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's 
the wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Thank you, Father, for the love of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the way that that love was shown on the cross, Lord, and in the resurrection of Christ. Father, we praise you, Lord, for this gospel message. We pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight, Lord, uh, through your word, Lord, that we might serve you more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, make your way to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Hey, Colin, did you get that... That video, is it going to work? Maybe. Hey, it's my fault. I gave it to him right before church. So if you remember, um, 
I guess it's been about two weeks ago uh, now, uh, I told you that the missions committee was going to give a uh, $1,000 uh, to, it's Mark Waters, uh, Mark and Michelle Waters' daughter and her husband there in Ecuador, uh, that they were helping with, with church planning there and doing a Bible school for kids. And uh, what they needed was the projector, and then there was, and, and a, like a you're right, like a speaker. And uh, so that's what that $1,000 went to, and they've already had their uh, service with the kids. And I don't know how many kids, but a great number of kids. About how many? Okay, they had to cut it off at 20 because of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they must have ran to the store, bought what they needed that day, and started it the next because uh, I've had that video for about a week now, and so... Uh, we were going to show that this morning, and I neglected to tell Colin we need to show that this morning. And so that's my fault. Uh, but I wanted you to see that uh, to let you know that the money that we give overseas, man, it has a reason for it going. And so it's wonderful to see those children, and it's wonderful to see uh, the work there and to hear the work there in Ecuador. Now, we're not a full-time partner with them or anything like that, uh, but we might be. We might be one day as God is moving. And their uh, son-in-law is being trained to hand out the Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes and to uh, be a part of that as well. And so it's kind of full circle back to something this church has done for a long time. Trainer of trainers of those shoe boxes. Gotcha. 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 So, so that's exciting to be a uh, very small part, but it's exciting to be a small part of that. Also, have a thank you card uh, that uh, that I got today, and it says this: It says Westside First Baptist Church. Thank you so much for all the kind words about our precious daddy and granddaddy. We really appreciated the prayers for our family during this difficult time. It says the meal after the funeral. Uh, at the church was wonderful. Thank you for hosting the family and providing all the delicious food. Uh, there's some kind words about me that I'm not going to read. Paul McCarty and Ray Moore also did a great job with some of Dad's favorite songs. Uh, Dad loved his pastor, his church, and his church family. Thank you for loving George and Batha Doolin. And, of course, this is from Greg and Gina and the whole family of uh, George Doolin. And I wanted to read that. I, you know, I don't always read every thank you card that we get. We seem to get so many, uh, and that's, that's such a blessing. But, you know, Sunday morning is really not the time to, to read those. But, you know, I wanted you to hear that because George was not just a member of our church. He was not just, a, uh, you know, an attender. George was a deacon. George was a servant in this church. George and Batha were a fixture in this church when I came. And I don't guess there was a service that went by. Uh, that they did not attend. And uh, I'm telling you, if you got the blessing of knowing George Doolin, that's what you got, was a blessing. It was a blessing. And, uh, y- you know, uh, it's not true with everyone you meet, is it? But but with George, it was such a blessing to get to know him. And uh, what a great man. I can't wait to spend eternity with a guy like George. And uh, what a great, phenomenal testimony uh, he had. And so, uh, anyway, thank you for all that you did for the Doolin family. I know it meant a lot. If you were here that day, you know we had the longest visitation that's been known to man uh, that day. We started at 9, and, and the service wasn't until 1 uh, that day. And so it was, a, it was an all-day affair, but what a blessing uh, to be a part of, of that service that day. So thank you, uh, not just from that family, but thank you uh, from the Straysner family as well. Uh, for all you did for for Bill and and Lisa, and continue to do for Lisa. If you happen to have Lisa Straysner's cell phone number, uh, you know she she can't hear; she's uh, hearing impaired. But she does receive texts, and so if you'll text her and just let her know you love her and praying for her, uh, encourage her to come back to church. She wants to get back in church. I think that'd be a blessing uh, to her as. Well, all right, Second Kings chapter six, a very familiar passage to those of us who have studied. Old Testament. Uh, This is the story of Elisha and his servant. You know, throughout uh, the last few weeks, ever since the bombing in Ukraine and then now the war in Ukraine and all of the issues that are surrounding that, I've been getting uh, text messages, emails, uh, sermons on end times. Uh, I listened to one last night from David Jeremiah. It was a great sermon. He did a fine job uh, preaching on the end times and what how Russia plays into the end times. And, you know, America is not there. 
But Russia is there in the end times. Russia is mentioned in prophetical uh, truth. And, and I've been getting all kinds of questions about, you know, how, you, how, how do we deal with this? You know, what do we do in a moment of, of crisis? And, you know, it, it, all of that kind of uh, culminated back a, a week ago this last Sunday, two weeks ago this last Sunday now, uh, when I preached, you know, what, how do you handle a hard moment? How do you handle a hard time? You handle it... Uh, with the truth of God's Word and, and trusting in Him. And I'm going to try to share that up once again. And I'm going to talk about faith and what it means to have faith. This text is familiar. I'm sure I've preached it here uh, before. I look back through notes to see when I might have preached out of 2 Kings 6 uh, in the past. And the, the closest I could find was like 2017. And it was on a Wednesday night. Half y'all wasn't here anyway. So we'll be fine. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the unveiling of faith. How God unfolds faith before our very eyes. Look there in verse 8 through 12. Verses 8 through 12, the Bible says this, Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent word to the kings of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. The king of Israel <clears throat> sent to the place about which the man of God told him, and thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which one of us is for the king of Israel? So, a little background. Uh, the Aramean king is after uh, the king of Israel. And the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, if you go to Israel, they'll say it this way, Elisha. I don't say Elisha because that is a woman's name. It just doesn't sound right. Elisha. Elisha is there. And you remember who Elisha is. Elisha is the one who was the servant of Elijah. And when Elijah was getting ready to be caught up in his chariot of fire up to heaven, when that took place, he asked of Elisha. He, he tried to leave him behind, if you remember that story. And Elisha just wouldn't leave him, man. He was just, he was with him. He said, no, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. And then Elijah finally says, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of what you have. And if you study what Elisha did, he did just that. He did twice as many miracles. He did twice as many works than Elijah, Elijah did, even though Elijah is the more prominent of the two prophets. Elisha actually did more. And so here in this moment, what he's doing is he's acting through the power of the Holy Spirit as a spy for the king of Israel. The Aramean king is after the nation of Israel. He's after the king of Israel. And every time he makes a move, it's like moving chess pieces on a board. Elisha already knows where he's headed. And so he sends word to the king of Israel. This was not the only time that this had taken place because this is known that Israel is always one step ahead of us. There's got to be someone in our camp who's a rat. Y'all know what a rat is? A rat is one who, you know, snitches get stitches. You know what I mean? That's what the king said. He said, which one are you for? The nation of Israel. Who is for the king of Israel? And listen to verse 12. Verse 12 says, one of his servants says, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Point number one, there is insight with the man of faith. By man of faith, I mean the person of faith. There is insight into God's behind the scenes of what's going on on the stage of the world. God gives insight to the person who's walking with God. God gives insight to the person who is trusting God in the midst of all the crazy chaos of this world. Can I just give you all some hope? If we'll just give this thing time, this war will end. I mean, it'll end or Jesus will come back and end it himself. It's going to end. Y'all remember March of 2020? It seems like 10 years ago, right? It really does. But it wasn't just a couple years ago. Y'all remember what happened that month? I had knee surgery. That's what happened that month. 
That's what happened that month. And then you remember that night where we had 500, it was the largest crowd we've had in this sanctuary that, that I know of. We had 514 people here that night that could be counted. We had the Isaacs. You remember that? Anybody remember that night? I mean, it was a good night. It was a good night. My doctor, Dr. Wallace, he said, uh, I told him, I said, now I'll get this surgery done, but we got a big group coming in. There'll be a big crowd, and I've got to go to church that night. Is that going to be a problem? Now, you just need to know this up front. It's the only surgery I've ever had in my life. All right? So you know I'm very naive. And I said, is that going to be a problem for me to come that night? He said, nah, won't be a problem at all. He told my wife, he said, he's going to be so knocked out that he won't even know he's in the world. And y'all remember that night? Y'all remember I had my cane? I came walking in, big smile on my face. Now, y'all, the next day was not pretty. And the day after that was even worse, all right? But, but it, I, I, I got over my surgery fairly quickly. And, and apparently whatever they gave me to knock me out did not knock me out. It woke me up. I mean, I was up. I was ready to go. When I got home, I tried to sit down. I got out in the yard and started walking around. My dad said, he's good. You really should not do that. You're going to really regret that. I said, well, I feel good. I don't want to sit down. And so I came that night. <laughs> that same weekend that we had the Isaacs here over at the Assembly of God Church, I talked to the pastor. Uh, today we're going to do our uh, sunrise service, Easter Sunday. We've been talking about it, doing it. We're going to do it down at the park uh, uh, Easter Sunday morning, 7 o'clock. We'll talk more about that between now and then. So we were talking about that. He said, I'm up to do anything other than anything that has to do with COVID. You remember, that was that weekend that COVID broke out in their church. Now, none of us knew what COVID was. And it was that Monday after that Friday night of the big event, 514 people, we shut everything down. Literally, from that morning to that afternoon, I called uh, back to the church, I was headed down to Little Rock to make a visit in a hospital that I called and said, I will not come because I've been in a group of 514 people and I don't know what's about to take place. We shut everything down. We shut the office down. We locked the doors, nobody in, and, and we all went home. And you remember that was the beginning of what we know now as the chaos of the pandemic, right? And everybody was concerned at first. But it kind of has passed. And this war, it will pass. Give it time. Something else bad's out there in the future. Just wait. It'll come. Could be a new pandemic. Boy, I hope not, don't you? Could be a war in another place. Man, I hope not. I really do. But there will always be bad things happening. Always. And because we have things like a cell phone in our pocket where we can see it and live in it, sometimes it becomes overwhelming. The person, the man or the woman who's walking with God, if, if you ask him, he'll say, well, now everybody else is looking what's happening on the stage. Come, let me show you behind the scenes. Let me show you what I'm up to and that I'm still on the throne, and that I haven't left, and that I have not resigned. Elisha wasn't hearing the things that the king was saying in his bedroom, right? The king of Aram was wrong, or his servants were wrong when they made that statement. They said that he knows what's going on in your bedroom. Man, he's in your head. We don't know how he knows, but he's always one step ahead. Elisha wasn't in the king's bedroom, was in the prayer room. Elisha was walking with God. Elisha knew what was happening by the hand of God. Do you know that the Lord knows what you say? He knows even what you think. 1 John chapter 3 says this, Little children, we must not love with word or speech, <coughs> excuse me, but with truth and action. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and will convince our conscience on the inside in his presence, even if our conscience condemns us, that God is greater than our conscience. Why? Because he knows all things. This is the doctrine of the omniscience of God, that God knows what's going to take place. Some call it foreknowledge. That God knows, that God has a providential plan that he knows and understands before it ever takes place. 
Though I am not a Calvinist that believes that everything is predetermined before birth, not at all. But I do believe and understand in the foreknowledge and the omniscience of God. If God doesn't know what's going to happen on Monday morning at 830, then he's not God at all. God knows what will take place. His word teaches that he knows what will take place. 1 Kings 8, 39 says this, For you alone know every human heart. By the way, that means Vladimir and Putin as well. He knows his heart. He knows what's going on in his mind and in his heart. Psalm 139, 1 through 4 says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my thought, excuse, my travels and my rest. You are aware of all <coughs> excuse me, my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. Before a word was ever on my tongue, God knows. God knew what I was going to preach today a thousand years ago. That's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Herschel Hobbes once stated, once known as one of the leaders, if not the leader in the convention of someone who was a commentator on God's word. He once stated that the foreknowledge of God is based upon his omniscience or all knowledge. Since the Bible views God as present at all times and places uh, contemporary span at all times, all right, that's, for, that's that word, in his universe, he knows all things simultaneously, thus he foreknows all things before they occur, everything. And y'all, that gives me peace. Let me tell you why. Before Vladimir Putin was born, he knew the Wednesday that he would say attack. And if it has taken place, it's because God has allowed it. Not caused it, but allowed it. God has allowed it to take place. Now, we can get deep into prophecy, and we can find Russia there, and we can start talking about everything that surrounds Russia in prophetical terms. And the war of Gog and Magog and all of those issues. And again, I told you, listen to David Jeremiah on that. It is a wonderful uh, truth that he teaches, and he might be right. He might not be. That could be the battle of Armageddon. That could not be the battle of Armageddon. No theologian really knows. And I've never claimed to be a theologian. But here's what I do know. Whenever that war takes place and whenever whatever prophetical truth is out there happens, God knows the date. Now, I sometimes talk about prophecy like it doesn't matter, don't I? I mean, it sounds that way. I don't mean that at all. You should study prophecy. You should try to figure things out and know what you believe. But I'm just going to tell you everything's going to be all right. God is in control. There is insight into what God is doing for the person who walks with God. And in this insight, there is this unveiling, this unraveling. It's like a scroll opening up of the faith of the man of God in the God who is always faithful. Verse 13, the Bible says this, so he said, he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Now, this is the king of Aram, saying, I want to go find this Elisha, and I want to take him. I want to snatch him up so that he doesn't go and tell the king of Israel uh, what's going on. He really wanted to kill him, is what he was after. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, the Bible says that when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out. So here's the picture. Two men, one tent, surrounded by this great army. I mean, the Bible says that he, he, he sent uh, horses and chariots and a great army there. Now, I don't know exactly what a great army is, but I, I've got an idea. It's more than a couple of folks, don't you? I get the image of hundreds, if not thousands, of riders and horses and chariots and armed men going. 
And then I get the picture of me waking up early in the morning, drinking my cup of coffee, stepping out on the back porch. That's what the attendant did. The attendant wakes up, and he stretches, and he rubs his eyes, and he looks around and says, well, I'll be dog. <laughs> there's a whole lot of y'all, and there's not many of us. And we're in trouble. He's kind of like a guy that was in my second church. He got thrown off of a horse, and his pastor happened to be there at that time, and this guy was kind of rough. And... Uh, they asked him, his first name was Dick. They said, Dick, what did you say? The pastor asked him, so what did you say when you fell off? Now, this is when he's laying on the concrete bleeding, all right? He's all busted up. I shared this with a Tuesday morning Bible study a couple weeks ago. He said he looked up at the pastor and said, what do you think I said? I said, goodness gracious, I look at what has happened to me. Now, that's what the attendant said when he walked out of the camp. <laughs> he looked around and said, we're in trouble. And you would have, too. If you let your circumstance be your vision. A week ago, yesterday, <clears throat> we went to the uh, little house on the prairie house. I've shared that with some of y'all. And man, you talk about a good time. I mean, it was a good time for Sarah and Alicia. All I did was drive and pay. That's what my job was. I looked at a guy. There was another guy from Hot Springs, him and his wife. I looked at him. I said, are you as fired up as I am? We had to wait to get in the house to take the tour at one of the houses, two houses. There's two houses, yeah. I looked at him. I said, are you as fired up as I am about this? He said, no, I'm not fired up at all. <laughs> said, I could care less about this, but my wife wants to go. And I said, I know she told you to go, and you came. He said, that's it. I said, well, my little girl, because she was dressed up in her prairie dress and the whole works. And I said, she wants to go, so here we are. Then we told her when we left, <clears throat> that's in north or excuse me, southeastern Missouri. We said, we can go wherever you want to go. And I said, you got two options because we don't have a lot of time. I said, now you can either, and this was my vote, go to Bass Pro in uh, Springfield, <laughs> and you can look at all of those wonderful fish in that tank. I don't care about looking at the fish. I want to go to Bass Pro, right? I said, or we can go to Branson, and you can do whatever you want to do. You just decide this is your day. We're going to have a good time. Well, she chose Branson. We did go to Lambert's where they throw the rolls, so I ate good that day. And then we went to Branson. And so we had some options when we got to Branson. I said, you can go. Uh, Alicia looked it up on the phone, you know, some fun things to do in Branson. We can go to an escape room which, by the way, was my vote, though I don't care about an escape room, but it got down to two. It was either the escape room or a flight simulator. Take me to the escape room. <laughs> I want the escape room, but I kept my mouth shut like a good daddy would, and so what did she choose? The, fight, the flight simulator. I went up and paid my money and got my ticket, and the whole time I'm looking on YouTube to see what this thing really is because it doesn't tell you anything about it. It just says you're going to fly across America. I've flown across America in an actual airplane, and it wasn't much fun. And so I was petrified. <laughs> but I didn't let anybody know I was petrified because I'm the man of the house. And nothing scares Daddy, right? My, my palms were sweaty. I'm telling you, I was a nervous wreck. And so we get in there, and there wasn't but about, I don't know, five or six of us that rode this thing. And they put you in this room, and you go over everything with the flight attendant, and she tells you to buckle your seatbelt. But she didn't have to tell me to buckle my seatbelt. I'm going to buckle my seatbelt. And so we get in there, and you can see this little roll-up, uh, like a garage door. There's two of them in front of you. And I'm thinking, well, it's going to roll that up, and... There'll just be a screen there, and it's just going to make you feel like, and I can overcome my mind. I can. Well, that's not what happened at all. The room went dark. You heard it go up, and then there's this screen. I don't know how big this screen is, but about the size of this sanctuary. And then they jet you out. The lady said we were four stories in the air, and I think it was 20. And I'm looking down thinking, my gosh, that's a long way down there. And your feet's just dangling. Well, mine didn't dangle because I found a way to get my heels into the bottom of my seat. And I'm holding on. <laughs> now, Sarah, Sarah, who is 10, is seated beside me having the time of her life. 
I mean, she's laughing and she's smiling. I'm over here. He's sweat beads. I mean, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. And they take, here you go. You take off, you know. And, and then you, you dip down and you go over. And when we got done, Sarah said, I don't know how long that lasted. I said, 14 minutes and 36 seconds. That's how I, I don't know how long that lasted. It wasn't that long. Thank the Lord we landed and got to get off and get out of there. And I said, we are going home. That's where we are going. Now, was I really going to fall? No. Was I really in the air? Well, I mean, I was lifted a little bit. No, I've been much higher than that. But when you're in the moment, reality is not what you feel. Remember, it's a simulator. It simulates what it would be like if you were to, quote, unquote, take a flight across America. When the attendant walked out, he was living by sight. Elisha still in the tent, living by faith. Faith is the unveiling of the truth of what's really going on. So what's really going on? Well, in this story, you see it there. He goes back in. He says, Master, what are we going to do? Elisha answers him in verse 16. Do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And here's what Elisha does. He just prays. And he says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What, what do you do? You don't live by sight. You live by faith. How did Elisha live by faith? Well, he walked with God. He prayed to God, right? But I believe it was in those moments where he couldn't see a way that he would remind himself, well, I got a way. His name is Jehovah Jireh. I've got a way. I know the King of Kings. I know the Lord of Lords. And I believe that it was in those moments of great fear. And there's no doubt Elisha must have had some fear. He was in those moments of unbelief by the attendant of what's going on. We didn't know why. We're in trouble. Elisha said, well, we would be but God. America would be in trouble, but God may very well save us. I would be in trouble if America fell, and if America does fall, and it very well may in my lifetime, that would be terrible, but God is in control. This church may fold up. I mean, there may come a day where this church folds up and we're not able to have service in this place anymore. We may have to file bankruptcy and it may just all be over. And I'm going to tell you that day is not anytime soon, but that could happen. And if that does happen, man, that would be, that would wreck my life and it would wreck my world. But God is in control of it all. And if that takes place, then it must have been either by his allowance or his will. Either way, I'm just going to keep walking with him. Russia may come into my home tonight and kill us all. That would be terrible. But God, who so loved the world, sent his only begotten son. That we have all believed in him. And so the Bible says that we have eternal life, which goes much further than Edgemont, Arkansas. And I'm just going to trust in him. Elisha prays and says, open his eyes. And when the attendant looks around, you know what he said? He said, well, all right then. <laughs> I didn't know. Now I know. Church, a lot of Christians out there are wavering in these moments. I mean, they really are. You hear all kinds of stuff. Some people are still huddled up at the house, scared to walk out. And I would be too. But God's holding my life in the palm of his hand. He has promised that if I walk with him, that he will garrison around me and he will fight on my behalf. I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned. We should be concerned. I keep up with it about every three or four days. I don't watch it every day. If I watch it every day, I'll be like the attendant. What are we going to do? About every three or four days, I check in to see what's happening. It's not getting much better. I look at what NATO's doing, which is not much. 
I look at what our nation's doing, which is not a lot, although I do believe there's probably more going on than what we see. I look at that, and I wonder what's going to happen. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. But I know this. The same God that was, was with Elisha is the same God that's with me. I don't know what Sundays look like around here. I mean, in the spiritual realm. But let me tell you what I envision. God has never opened my eyes that I might see, and I don't want him to. I'm good, all right? Just, you just do your thing, Lord, I'll do my thing, you know? I don't want to start seeing visions and dreams and all that. And you may be all for that, and if you are, that's great. Don't need them. Got the word of God. I'm just going to stand on it. I don't know what Sundays look like, but I envision demons of hell doing all they can to stop everything that happens in this place. I envision a great spiritual battle that we can't see happening all around this place and any other place that preaches the gospel. And I envision that there is a moment in the battle when God speaks and it is all over. And I don't know exactly when that takes place, but I think that happens every Sunday. I envision that happening around us. I also envision happening, happening around me. Satan doing everything that he can to stop me from preaching the word of God. And I believe he does that with every preacher that's going to stand with a Bible open and preach truth. Every single week. And I envisioning him overcoming me if it's just me. But God, who fights on my behalf. You see, I've seen his salvation. I know what it looks like in my life. I've seen the fact that he has set me aside and he has made me a saint of his, a child of his. And I know what happens if you mess with my child. I can only imagine what happens when you mess with his. Elisha prays and the Lord opens the attendant's eyes. And it's a great story. The Bible says his eyes were open, chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness and pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Don't you want to have that kind of word in heaven? That when you speak, heaven listens and, and honors your words because your words are God's words. God heard his prayer. Struck him, with, struck him with blindness. And then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city, but follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. Now, that's not Dothan. And by the way, we're not talking Dothan, Alabama either, all right? Just let that be known. He leads them the opposite way. Now, you get the picture. If I'm right, we'll just say hundreds. We won't say thousands, but we'll say hundreds. And all of them are there to attack Elisha. They're at the camp. Everything's about to go down. And Elisha goes out to the attendant and says, what are you so shook up about? Well, look, a bunch of them and a few of us. What are we going to do? Lord, open his eyes. Show him what you're up to. His eyes are open. Elisha prays. And they're struck with blindness. The whole army of the king of Aram. And he just takes those there and says, you're not going the right way. Follow me. I'll show you the way. <laughs> so he just starts walking. And you get the picture. Elisha walking from town to town, from place to place, from area to area, with these hundreds of people armed for battle to get him or following him away from where he was. Well, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? I get the picture in heaven of God grabbing a couple of angels and says, boys, watch this. They thought they were going to kill him. Not only are they not going to kill him, but I'm going to have them lead him, lead them away from him by following him. That's pretty good. Elisha marches them over. They follow him. They continue to go. And the Bible says in verse 20, when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men. Now, I may have prayed that after I got a few miles away, but I don't believe I'd have prayed it right there in that moment. 
But he says, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Now, here's what he said. He didn't say, that sounds real dignified, right? He said, can I kill them? Can I kill them now? Is it time for me to kill them now? I, I want to kill them. And he answered, you shall not kill them. He said, would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? He said, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Let me just put my finger here and say this. One of the reasons why this nation treats prisoners of war well or better than other nations is a biblical reason. So he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their masters. And the marauding bands of Arameans, of Arameans did not come again to the land of Israel. You know why? They whipped. They've been defeated. The Bible doesn't even say Elisha had a sword. Defeated by the hand of God. God overcame. God moved. And they were defeated. How do we overcome the armies that surround us? By trusting in Him. By trusting in Him. You don't need me to pray that your eyes would be open. You just need to open your eyes and look in the book. God has promised to be with us. He's promised never to leave us. He's promised never to forsake us. He's promised to walk with us if we'll walk with Him. And He says that even if I send really bad things, pestilence, if my people who are called by my name, that'd be Westside First Baptist Church and many others just like it. If they'll humble themselves, if they'll understand that you're the only one in the tent and there's a great army out there, and if you try to defeat it on your own, you'll die. But if they'll humble themselves and say, Lord, I feel just like the attendant. I don't know what we're going to do. Lord, would you show me what you're up to? He says, if you'll humble yourself and pray, and seek my face. He says, my ear will be attentive. And I'll work. The second Chronicles 7, 14, you, you know where it's at, right? And it's just as true in 2022 as it was when God spoke to Solomon. God hasn't changed. God's still moving. God still has an army of angels encamped around his people you say well i'm not elisha no you're not you're greater than elisha because not only are you moved by the spirit not only does his spirit rest on you but his spirit lives in you everything changed when jesus came now, the way to God has always been the same. It's by faith. It'll always be by faith. But the faith road got real easy when Jesus came. Now, when you choose to believe in him, he chooses to seal you. He comes into your heart. And he lives and he abides in here. Now, he's not speaking from the outside in. He's speaking from the inside out. I used to tell teenagers that year and a half I was a youth minister. And I used to tell them, why in the world would I, if I were God and could speak to your innermost self, why would I ever come to the outside and say a word? God lives inside of us. The power, all the power that Elisha had, we have that and more, and we have constant access to the throne room of God. That's why Hebrews tells us to walk up boldly into his presence and say, here I am. And here's what I need. And he'll begin to act and move and work on our behalf. You know why that's not happening in most Christians' life? They're living by what they see, not by what he sees. 
I heard this illustration one time. I got four or five more that I didn't even read here, but I heard the illustration once of, and I've shared this before in this church, but of we're like the little boy in the backyard looking through the wooden fence through the knot hole and watching the parade go by. Some of y'all have heard this. It's the best I can come up with, though, on the, the sovereignty of God and his providence and his omniscience, his all-knowing. We're like the little boy who's watching, and we see the drummers go by, and the trumpeteers go by, and we see the flag holders go by, and if you're from Arkansas, the four-wheelers go by, right? You see those things go by one at a time, group at a time. You may see a handful of people, but you can't see many. You're looking through a knot hole. And God's like the daddy who's looking over the top of the fence, seeing the parade start to finish. God's got this. He, he didn't resign. He didn't quit. He didn't take his hands off the world. He's still working. He's still moving. And I don't know about you, but I sleep better when I know that. I wonder what the attendant thought that night as he laid his head down on the pillow. Now, the story right before this story is Elisha makes an axe head to float. You know what the story is right after this? There's a, a great famine in the land. And one woman tells to another woman, you bring your son, we'll, we'll boil him tonight. And we'll eat him. And then after we eat him, we'll eat mine. Can I just tell you, hard times have always been. They will always be as long as this old world keeps spinning. But if you've been studying Revelation on Tuesdays, you know this whole world's coming to Jesus. And one day all the pain and all the suffering and all the hurt will all be over. But until then, I don't know about you, but I choose to walk with him. I choose to place faith in him. I choose to show up on Sunday and see what he's going to do. But I got good news. He walks with me on Monday just like he does Sunday. You know, I didn't really believe Russia would bomb Ukraine. I just, I really didn't. I heard it. I, I, I read it. I saw it. In the, always talking about something bad on the news. And I just didn't really believe it happened. I also didn't really believe that if it did happen, that America would just stay out. I just didn't believe that would happen either. And it may not happen before it's all said and done. And I know we've done some things, but not, not much. And I've got to be honest, I don't know what I want America to do. I'm just glad we've got people who are smarter than me making those decisions. But it happened. Ukraine has been bombed. People have died. Innocent people have died. Refugees by the millions leaving. You can't trust anything you see on television. You don't know. Who's telling the truth? Who's not? It's a sad world in which we live. But every time I open my Bible, I can trust it. And if you'll stay in this more than CNN or Fox, I think you'll be better off. And at the end of the day, when Jesus steps to the bow of the boat and tells the waves to hush, they hush. And just as the disciples were amazed, so am I every time he does it but he just keeps walking up there telling things to hush in my life he's been so good to me Elisha what are we going to do Lord open their eyes that west side may see I don't know what's going on in your life we got some people going through some hard times I know Russia and Ukraine and all that's over it's over there We've got people here dealing with cancer. They're dealing with the scare of illness and sickness. What are we going to do? Lord, open our eyes. Open my eyes that I may see that greater is he who is for us than all that garbage that is against us. Let's pray. And Father, I don't know what you'll do with the message tonight, but Father, I pray you've encouraged. 
Lord, maybe there's some conviction as well. And Lord, it's so easy to lose faith. Lord, I do not believe that the attendant was showing a lack of faith. I just don't believe he had the insight that his master did. He went to the right place. He went to Elisha and said, what are we going to do? And Lord, in those moments where we are like the attendant, where we don't know what to do, Father, we, we've got nowhere else to run but to you. And Lord, I'm grateful in the story that Elisha doesn't throw him away. But he just prays. And Lord, I'm grateful when I show a lack of faith in my own life that you don't throw me away. You, you just begin to move and work in my own life. So, Father, whatever you're doing in this room, Father, I pray you have freedom to do it in these moments. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heavenless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Hey, we're, we're not going to skip the next verse. We're not going to skip the next verse because you can't. He's been on the cross. His body has been laid. But we're going to sing of him coming back from the grave. Now listen, the Methodists don't meet on Sunday night. They're all in their homes. But we want to sing loud enough that every one of them can know that we're worshiping the Lord in this place. All right? All right? Can we do that? If you believe that he arose from the dead, then let's sing and worship him. All right, Brother Paul, lead us. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Woo. That's good, y'all. Man, he's coming. And soon. We'll see the king. Until he comes, may he find us awake, alert, and ready. Hey, you know how you stay that way, right? You came this morning. Go share Jesus. Go share Jesus. There's a lost world out there. They're wondering what's going to happen. We have the insight. Our scroll has been unrolled through the 66 books in this word. Go tell them. Go tell them. 
A lot of things going on this week. You know everything that's going on. Don't forget, Man Church, Thursday night, 6 o'clock. Guys, don't forget it. Hope you come. Again, Ed Jackson's going to be here to share uh, from his heart. He speaks all over uh, this part of the country about to men and men's ministry. And so I hope you come and are a part of, of uh, Thursday night. Again, 6 o'clock. We're going to have uh, large mouths going to be catering. Uh, Thursday night, we will have pizza, and we will have salad, and it'll be Miss Linda's salad, all right? There's some women in here that's going to be kind of upset, but sorry about that. Maybe they'll bring you a little bite home, all right? So, uh, so that'll be Thursday night. Guys, if you want to bring a drink or, and or a dessert, then I think we'll have, uh, we'll have plenty. We're going to change our meeting place. We're going to uh, move from the fellowship hall down to the youth room. We've been talking about doing that and everything's set up down there. We have a little kitchen and so we'll move from there uh, to downstairs. I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it uh, down there. Some of you haven't seen the youth room before and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice uh, place, really nice area down there. So again, that's Thursday night, 6 o'clock. Everything else is still on go. Next week will be spring break so we will not have anything on Wednesday and we'll also have no Tuesday morning men's prayer breakfast. We'll have no Bible study that day. Uh, ladies, are y'all meeting that day? Y'all are meeting. Brother Roger, are the men meeting that day? Well, I may have canceled just then. I, I don't know. I won't be there that day, so I don't care what y'all do. Um, <laughs> anyway, all of that's going on uh, in the next couple of weeks. So you know everything that's happening. If you don't, read your bulletin or give us a phone call. Somebody will let you know. Don't call Roger or Paul. They probably don't know either, all right? So <laughs> anyway, y'all, again, the video, what a blessing to be a part of those kids. What a blessing to be a part of that. Brother Leon walked the aisle a week ago today, and he made the statement. He said, if I don't witness this week, I'm going to resign as the chairman of the mission committee. And I know what he's thinking. Same thing I thought before. How, how dare we preach and say we're going to do this, that, and the other, and we're not witnessing like we should. None of us are, including me. And man, that just, that just encouraged me. And that afternoon, he texted me and said, well, I don't have to resign. Now, I tell you that, not to brag on Leon and I hope he doesn't mind me saying that. But I tell you that to say, if you haven't done it, then get to work. People need it. People need it. Brother Leon, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?